we want to welcome you all to, all to our webinar workshop this Friday morning. We appreciate you taking the time to spend just a small part of your day with us. My name is Brian Griffin, a marketing assistant here at Messer Financial Group. Many of you are already familiar with Messer Financial, but in case you don't know, we are an FMO located in Mint Hill, North Carolina. We started with just two agents and now serving over 20,000 plus agents across 40 states and still growing. So Doug and Richard, thank you so much for getting up with us. I see your comments here already. Uh, so 10 days ago, Ken Smith went over four basic principles of selling. The simplicity of those principles were actually shocking, but the impact of the principles were immediate. I used the analogy of building a house last time that we talked, and I'm sure when each of us go and shop for houses, no one really thinks about the foundation of the house. We just see the end result, and that's what we gravitate towards. But before the bay windows and the wood floors and marble countertops, there has to be a blueprint in place. So this is actually what's going to ensure that the house is built to exact specifications and hopefully the builder doesn't skimp on materials. Ken is actually giving us the blueprint so we can build the sales career that we want. So as long as we don't cut corners, we should get the sales results that we envision. So Ken has over 40 years insurance sales experience. Um, he's the author of the best-selling book, Sales Lessons from the Masters, and we are so lucky to have him as our national sales trainer. So before we do get started, a few housekeeping rules. We're going to hold all questions until the end of the presentation. If you do have questions, just type in the box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. But now, without any further ado, Mr. Ken Smith. Brian, thanks for that great introduction. One of the things at Mester Financial, we realize that we need to earn your business. And we're not just saying that. Uh, we, you know, we've got great products, great, great technology, um, the all-in program, but we realize that there's more to growing your business. And I am not aware of any other FMO that's doing sessions like this. And that's why I'm really excited to be part of Messer Financial. You know, this morning, I really have two expectations. What I want you to do is come away with one sales idea from this session that you can implement immediately. And then what I want you to think about as we're going through this presentation, I really want, to, want you to think about what's your greatest challenge and what is the one area that you can work on that would have the greatest impact growing your business. Now this morning, um, last last session we did a session we did a week ago. I had some great emails from everyone, and I really appreciate those. And I know some of you um, took great notes. Now this morning, I'm I'm going to say, don't write down anything I say. And you're thinking, crap! I'm going to spend an hour with Ken, and he's not going to say anything worth writing down. I'm not going to say anything worth writing down for you. Because I want you to think about it. How many times have we gone to meetings, taken incredible notes, and left there saying that was the greatest meeting ever, and never looked at those notes and never did anything about it? Here's one of the problems people only remember about 10% of what you said after 10 minutes. And I will tell you, sometimes I think that's too much. And those of us who have worked with clients and prospects over years, I know can really, really attest to that fact. Here's what I want you to do. My objective this morning is I want to pull out some thoughts that are lying dormant. You know, here's the thing. I believe you already know what you need to do to become more su successful. And my job is to pull those thoughts out of you. So here's what I want you to do. Don't write down anything I say. What I want you to write down is what you think of as a result of what I say. In, in the last session we did, I talked about Frank Betcher and how Frank Betcher used enthusiasm to work his way as a baseball player all the way to the major leagues. And when he was failing, 
as a salesperson, he went through Dale Carnegie's course. Dale Carnegie talked about enthusiasm and Betcher thought about back to how the enthusiasm made a difference with his baseball career and then he applied it to a sales career and took his business to the next level with it. So don't write down anything I say, write down what you think of as a result of what I say. There's a picture of my book, Sales Lessons from the Masters. And one of the things I wanna do this morning is introduce you to my four mentors who I write about in the book. First, there's Frank Betcher. Frank Betcher was a, a major league baseball player, went into the insurance business, was failing miserably, and turned his career around. And he wrote a book, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. That book kept me in the business my first year because he wrote about every, he felt every feeling I was feeling and just all the challenges. And as I read his book, I believe that if he was able to survive and get through it, I could survive and get through it. And again, that book was written over 70 years ago. But again, if you look on Amazon, there's over a thousand current comments. And he's talking about sales principles he used over a hundred years ago. My second mentor is W. Clement Stone. Stone started with, in 1920 with $100, and by the late 1970s, he had built it into a billion-dollar company. From Stone, I learned the importance of attitude, presentation, and having a sales system or a sales process. Ben Feldman is, by consider, is considered to be the greatest life insurance salesman whoever lived. In the 1960s, he was selling over $100 million of life insurance regularly. Um, there's a presentation that I've listened to many times um, from the 1981 Million Dollar Roundtable meeting. And when he spoke at that 1981 Million Dollar Roundtable meeting, there were over 1,800 life insurance companies in the United States. He personally had more life insurance in force than two thirds of those companies. So pretty, pretty amazing. And then Joe Gandolfo. Joe Gandolfo in 1966 qualified for the Million Dollar Roundtable. He heard Ben Feldman speak. He set a goal to be Ben Feldman. In 1975, he personally sold over a billion dollars worth of life insurance. And the reason I mentioned those four is here's one principle that I have found consistently is that great salespeople in the insurance business learn from other great salespeople. And today, what I'm going to do with you is we talked about four principles the last time. I'm going to share three principles with you this morning. But first, I have to ask, do you know what happens to, to salespeople who don't use sales principles? They're, they end up unemployed. And you don't want to end up like this one poor salesman. He's out looking for another job. He gets to the zoo. The zookeeper says, things are horrible here. Our gorilla died. We can't afford to buy another gorilla. So he, he hired this unemployed salesperson to dress up in a gorilla suit and act like a gorilla. Now, this guy really got into the job and he found that the, when he was on a swing, the higher he would swing, the more the kids would come and they would applaud for him and they and they loved it. Unfortunately, one day he went up, the swing broke and he ended up in the lion's den and he started screaming, help, help, save me. And the lion put his paw on his shoulder and said, shut up, buddy, or we'll all get fired. 
So remember that story as we're going through talking about the importance of sales principles. W. Clement Stone said something that is so important. You can evaluate the principles I'm sharing with you by one standard only, the action you take and the results you achieve. I have two questions for you this morning, and I want you to think about these. Are you happy with your sales results? And do you want to get better? If you want to get better, I want you to stay with me, and I want you to think like we talked about earlier. You know, one of my favorite stories is a reporter back in the 1960s asked the then Pope, Pope John, how many people work in the Vatican? And Pope John responded about 20%, which leads into principle number five, making calls. You know, Ben Feldman said, there is no easy way to sell life insurance. And I will say there is no easy way to sell insurance. The key is you have to make calls. Nothing in this business happens until you, we make a call. And here's the most important thing is there's something called momentum. And if you think about it, um, Momentum is one of the most important things in sales. Okay, it's kind of like when you're on a roll and you're closing sale after sale and everything's going together for you. You know, you've got that moment, you got that momentum. But here's the other thing I want you to think about is, you know, those days when you make calls, you're not getting sales, it's getting you're frustrated. Here's what I want you to remember is when you're doing that is you're building you're building momentum. You know, if I go out, make a bunch of calls today, maybe don't get anything, but I keep coming back the next day, continue to make calls. I'm gonna to start to pick up some people that are gonna say yes. If I keep going, I'm gonna keep building momentum. Even those days when you make the calls and nothing happens, you're still building momentum there. You know, Joe Gandolfo, who I mentioned, he had been in the, in the business eight years, and the president of his company introduced him as having 16 years of experience. And Gandolfo kind of did a double take when he, when he did that. But he said he thought about it, and what the president of the company was getting at was, you know, if the average salesperson made 200 calls in a year, and he made 400 sales calls, he had twice as much experience as the average salesperson, just by the nature of the calls he made, the, present, the extra presentations he made. So he said it really made sense. The more calls he made, the more experience that he, he got. Frank Batcher, um, when he was starting in the business, the president of his company came in and was talking to all the new agents in the business. And he came down to this meeting and he said, the president said, show me a person in this business who will tell their story to five people a day and I'll show you someone who can't help but succeed in this business. You know." And this business narrows down to one thing, and that's making making calls. You know, I always I like the section. What I the key to what we do is we've got to see the people. You know, the way we see the people in this environment may be a lot different than it was five, ten, fifty, a hundred years ago. Whether it's by phone, whether it's in Zoom meetings, that's changed. But the one thing that hasn't changed is the principle that we have to see people and we've got to make calls. You know, Gandolfo said, every time you get a no, it gets you closer to a yes. You know, there's a thing of laws of, laws of the law of averages, okay? And the law of averages says, if you ask enough people to buy, sooner or later, someone is going, someone is going to buy. 
Now we can improve those numbers um, by the way we ask questions and following a sales process, but it still is asking people to buy. You know, I wanna share something with you and just to illustrate. Um, I worked five, six years ago, maybe seven years ago, I worked with a group of health insurance agents in the under 65 market to help them cross sell um, life insurance that are clients outside of open enrollment. And here's, here's what happened. Um, when, when we finished the program, you know, for every 15 calls they made to ex existing clients, seven of them said yes. And they had four sales as a result of those 15 calls. Now, the average commission was, as a result of those 15 calls, was $2,400. Okay, so they got four sales and the average annualized commission was $600 per sale. So out of every 15 calls, they made $2,400. So here's the thing, whether the person said yes or no, every time they talked to their client, it was worth $160. You know, and it's even, when the numbers first started, even if it was 24 calls to get those four sales, that, may, that would mean each call was worth $100. I don't know where you can find many jobs or many careers where every time you pick up the phone and talk to an existing client already, it's worth $100. So the question I have, I'm going to ask you, is have you ever experienced a slump? You know, I get calls from agents over the years many, many times. And every time the first question I ask them is how many calls were you making before it happened? And then how many calls have you made afterwards? And what I found is that every time someone goes into that slump and they're not getting the sales, is what happens is they start hearing those no's. And as a result of hearing those no's, they stop making sales. You know, when you hear the no's, just remember every time you hear that no, it's getting you closer to that yes. Principle number six is repetition. Now, I know you're thinking, how is repetition um, a sales principle? I'll tell you what. Repetition is actually one of my favorite sales principles. Here's the thing, without repetition, you don't grow or change. And when I'm speaking to groups, I tell them, you suck. And you know, what happens, I want you to think about this, is that whenever you or I start anything new, we suck at it. And I'll give you, give you an example. Suppose you're in the MA market and you decide you wanna start cross-selling final expense to your clients. You know, even with a script, even with some practice, those first few calls may be a little, may be a little rough around the edges. And you probably won't be great at it initially, but the more you do it, the better you get. Um, just like those, those agents that I worked with in, in the health insurance market to sell life insurance to the underage market. Those numbers weren't as good at first, but the more they did it, the better those numbers got and the more income they generated. Here's the thing, salespeople hate repetition, you know, and you know, we need to start looking at repetition as really our friend. Um, I mean, I think about it over the years. When, when I've done training, um, I can still remember getting calls from agents that I worked with that said, hey, Ken, what you're telling me to do doesn't work. And then I would ask them, how many times, how many times did they do it? And, you know, they'll say two or three times. And I'm saying two or three times 
is not you're not going to you're not going to get it in two or three times you have to keep doing it over and over again and you have to keep following the the process because here's what happens the more we do something the more we're able to master master that i'm going to give you a couple examples so you can see this that's me on a on a slack line um I made a decision last summer after watching American Ninja Warrior that I wanted to be the oldest one to complete the course. Um, and I started I started working out and my balance starting out was pretty horrible. I was in half decent shape to begin with, but my balance really needed work. And for me to go across from end to end on that slack line, I will say it took over 300 times and and probably four hours of work before I made it across the slack line and in training one of the things I had to follow my own advice because in training what I would do would be basically take one obstacle work on that one obstacle until I was able to master it before I would move on to the next obstacle so I had to take my own advice in, in, in the training process with American Ninja Warrior. I also want you to think about this. Think about the fact that you listen to a song. If you really like the song, after you hear it one time, you may remember some of the words. You hear it five times, you can start to kind of sing, sing it, sing it, you remember the words and you can kind of sing it with the music. After 10 times, you can remember the words without the music. So that repetition works over and over again. Now, if you're over 40 years old and you're on this call, I'm going to give you a test. And, you know, we can't do it verbally, but I want you to answer mentally. Don't squeeze the Charmin, right? The quicker picker-upper is bounty. Wendy's, where's the beef? You deserve a break today, so get up and get away to McDonald's. And then I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. Now, I will bet if you're over 40, you can all remember and fill in that last word on the commercials. Guess what? None of those commercials have been used in the last 30 years. But after 30 years, you still remember it. Why? Because the repetition, you heard it time after time on the TV and that repetition worked and you can still pull it up. Here's the thing. If you want to change yourself, repetition becomes a key. Repetition is how you change habits, and that's how you change you change your life. I'm going to give you the secret for my career. You know, with working with agents and doing training, my goal in life has been to say the same thing to an agent 10 times in slightly different ways. And my objective is to have that agent pick up the phone and say, can I got this great idea and it's my words coming back to me. So what does a good salesperson and a good actor have in common? And I'm gonna wait a minute before, we, before I answer that question. Um, Brian, are you ready with the polling question? I want you to take a minute right now and answer this, po this polling question. It's up, Ken. Okay, great. We'll give them a minute to answer. And the polling question is, have you practiced your presentation? Okay, do we want to take a look and see what the results are? All right, so we have 72% yes, 
and and twenty eight percent no. Wow. Okay. This is I have to say this is an exceptional group because in most cases um, it ends up flipping around totally where about 75% have never practiced their presentation and 25% have. So I love, I love this, I love this group. So I'll go back to my question. What does a good, a good salesperson and a good actor have in common? They basically, they practice and they rehearse. Principle number seven is presentation. There we go. Here's the key to a solid present to a solid presentation. We have to think like actors. When we're in front of a client, we have to think like actors and almost think in terms that it's not just a presentation, it's a performance. You know, we have to really be into it. The second thing is that's a key is if you remember from last week. Socrates. You know, basically Socrates' approach was if we want to change someone's way of thinking, the key is asking questions. And, you know, I always used to joke, um, both, both salespeople and um, good trial lawyers can thank Socrates because with changing someone's thinking, if you look at a trial lawyer and you think about a trial lawyer, basically when they have a witness, they only ask questions when they know how the, the, the witness is gonna answer. And that's one of the same things. If we're gonna change someone's thinking, we have to basically ask questions and we know what that person's response is gonna be. You know, number three, is basically our approach and we have to believe in what we're doing we have to believe that when we're in front of a prospect that what we're doing is solving a problem for that prospect and they may not know that prospect but it's important to look at it from the perspective and believe we're solving that problem and we're making a difference for that prospect Number four is we have to speak in the prospect's language. Um, you know, I was going through um, with someone Medicare Advantage presentation this week. And it doesn't do good to read the, the definitions on the brochure. We have to be able to put that, put that together and give examples that the prospect understands. Five, you got to keep it simple. Six is enthusiasm. And I believe enthusiasm is really important because, again, we talked about last week about just how human emotions are transferable. And it, you don't have to be pounding on the table, but if you're excited, you're enthusiastic about what you're doing, um, that goes, that comes across to the prospect. And again, how do you become enthusiastic? You act enthusiastic. And then the seventh thing is it's important with a solid presentation that it includes some repetition in there. There's our friend, repetition. You know, with changing our behavior, with getting a prospect to understand something, repetition is really important. Now, one of the reasons I ask about practicing the presentation is um, Frank Batcher. Um, said, you know, there was a, a guy that moved up. He was in Philadelphia, and there was a guy that had moved up from the South. And the guy, the agent was concerned about, you know, speaking in different terms, in different language with people in Philadelphia versus compared to the South. And so he asked Betcher if he could practice his presentation on Betcher, and then Betcher could practice his presentation on, on him. And Betcher said that he had never thought about that. But he said when they worked together and practiced their presentations on each other, 
he really started to see areas where he could improve his presentation and really take his really take his business to the next level. You know, the other one I think about is back when I was with Mutual of Omaha. Um, in Mutual of Omaha, there was one office that did about 60% of the total of disability income with sales with Mutual of Omaha. And the reason they did that was, number one, they had a sales process. Everyone in that office followed for disability income. And they practiced the presentation. They would not let an agent go out and make calls on his or her own until they could present the disability, used to do the disability presentation to the general manager for that office. So your presentation and practicing your presentation makes a big difference. Now, Ben Feldman, who I write about in the book um, and is considered to be the greatest life insurance salesman ever, he basically sold packages. That was one of the keys to his success. And basically, the packages were really, what I say, bundles of participating whole life insurance to solve a specific problem. But when he put a package together, what he would do is he would practice on his wife, his office, his office staff. And then when I was writing the book, I talked to his son, Marvin. And Marvin said that when his dad was putting together a new package, he would practice on Marvin and his brother, Richard. And he said, by the time we graduated from high school, we knew more about uh, life insurance than some people in the insurance business. But he said, what his dad was trying to do is that he believed that if his presentation was simple enough for a high school student to understand, then a business owner should be able to understand it. You know, one of the things that, that I do differently that has worked consistently um, throughout my career when it comes to cost as part of, you know, in, your, in a presentation. You'll see, if you look at the needs analysis that I use, basically you come down to three alternatives for the prospect or the client to choose. And I break the cost down to a, a daily cost basis. What's this program cost each and every day? And what I'll do is I'll take that premium on a daily cost basis and basically say, hey, that's about, it's gonna cost you about a cup of coffee a day. Um, you know, in, in the training for the, the needs analysis, you know, I use the example, you know, this program is going to cost you less than lunch at McDonald's on a daily, on a daily cost basis. So, you know, and here's the thing. Um, one of the things I was thinking about this morning when, uh, and, and this presentation was I had a friend up in, up in Canada who sold critical illness insurance and his target market and he worked a lot with Tim Horton franchise owners. And he always put the, his sales in the perspective of, you know, what this, what this cost? It cost about five minutes worth of sales at um, sit from 6.55 to seven o'clock in the morning. So, you know, cup of coffee, here's my question. Which sounds better when you're talking about the cost? say, hey, this is gonna cost you a cup of coffee a day or $150 a month. One of the things in clo with closing a sale, here's the thing. If you never ever say, do you wanna buy this? If you say to a prospect, do you wanna buy this? Picture me coming across, flying across a desk, tackle tackling you. Never say this. The key is when you're closing a prospect is basically give alternatives. You know, 
in this case, I always like to give three alternatives because the prospect will pick the, usually picks the one in the middle. But in this case, you know, we've got one plan that's a hundred thousand and it costs two thousand dollars per year. Another one that's two hundred thousand and costs four four thousand dollars per year. And I'm going to say, okay, here's your two options, Mr. or Ms. Prospect. Which one best fits in with your current financial situation? And see. The thing is, when you give options in your presentation, you know, it's not, if you have one option, it's yes, no. If you have two options, it's yes, yes. And which one fits in with your present financial situation? Here's my question for you. Do you know why, the, do you know people, basically, do you know why underwriters need to be buried 20 feet below the ground? because down deep, underwriters are really nice people. The question I wanna ask you is, if you were president of your own company, which you really are, would you buy stock in that company? You know, the, and the question I would ask is, if you're president of your own company, what do you need to do to turn your company into a growth company? You know, presidents of of big corporations hire consultants to come in and give them advice on what to what to do. One of the things I will do with you is if you want, you know, I'll talk through things with you and help you say, okay, this is where I need to work on. What do I need to do? And one of the things is we hate to change. But with everything going on around us, you know, we hate change, okay? People hate change. But here's the other side of it. Change and what we're doing today and what we're going through in this environment creates opportunities. Sometimes when we start in the process, we don't know what opportunities are gonna be there, but there are opportunities that always come about because of, because of change. One of my favorite quotes is from Lou Holtz. After winning the national championship at Notre Dame, he retired He retired uh, for a couple of years and then went to South Carolina. And one of the things he said was when he went to, when he started at South Carolina, he wanted to run the same uh, offense that he ran at Notre Dame. But two things. He didn't have the players to be able to do it, and he didn't believe it would work as well with this in the SEC. You know, ver very few people embrace change, even when change is necessary. Most people don't want to change. I didn't want to change, but I had to in order to win. And, you know, we find ourselves in that environment. If we want to take it to the next level, if we want to improve our sales, you know, we're not going to get there by doing the same thing over and over again. We've got to take that step back and say, okay, in effect, I'm president of my own company. What do I have to do to take my business to the, to the next level? Okay, I'm going to ask you to take a minute here, and I want you to post um, the one idea, the one sales concept that she's gotten from this session, and then we'll talk about it. And Brian, if I can get you to read some of those off as they come in. Absolutely. Think like an actor, rehearse and perform. Let's see here, have a sales process, increase calls, work on packages, presentation and knowing how to ask the right question. Never ask, do you want to buy this plan? <laughs> and repetition is the key. Excellent. Okay. No, that sounds that sounds good. You you guys are really you guys are really paying attention really paying attention. Um, I want to share a story um, about oppor about opportunity. Um, Russell Conwell was a minister in Philadelphia. And he had, he was minister of, this is back in the late 1800s, 
of a large blue collar congregation. And it was a situation back then where not many people could afford to go to college. And he had some of the members of his congregation said, hey, we really want to go to college, um, you know, can't, but we can't, we'll never afford it. Can you teach some classes? And basically, they started teaching some classes at his church. And he saw the need for a college um, that was really affordable for the time. And what he did is he put together a lecture that he, back then, that he delivered over 6,000 times. And that lecture was used to start and to fund Temple, what's Temple University today. But his lecture was called Acres of Diamonds. And before he was, uh, before he became a minister, he had been a, a reporter and he was traveling in Africa. And there was a story that an African um, guide told him. And it was about a, a, a farmer, a wealthy farmer by the name of Ali Hafen. And someone had come and told Ali Hafed about the value of diamonds and what having diamonds could do for him as far as wealth. You know, Ali Hafed decided he was going to sell the farm and he was going to go out and search for diamonds. So he sold the farm and he searched the, the African continent in diamond for diamonds. He ended up throwing himself into the sea, dead broke, never found diamonds. The farmer that had bought his farm, priest came by one day and saw saw something on his mantle. And, you know, he's the priest said, has Ali Hafid returned? I see a diamond on your on your mantle. And he said, no, he hasn't returned. And that's just some rock I picked up out of the out of the creek. And he the the priest took him down and you look at and basically Ali Hafid had gone off to search of diamonds. And he, his farm was literally sitting on acres of diamonds. It, it, it turned out at that time to be one of the richest diamond mines in the world. And that applies so much to us. Um, you know, we keep looking for something else. And really, if we will take the time to look at the diamonds that are under us and mining those diamonds, it's incredible with what we can do. There's my contact information. And I, I will tell you, I really, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to work with you and to spend the time with you. One of the things that I, I found this week is um, the link to the audio version of my book. And I'm gonna make a deal, I'm gonna make a deal with you. If you will send an email to me, K S M I T H at messerfinancial.com. And tell me what your biggest challenge, what your biggest challenge is, or what's one thing you need to do to really grow your business. I will send you the audio version of my book. So with that, again, I, I'd love to send you the audio version. I'd love to talk with you. I've had some great conversations um, with some of you after, after the session last week. So with that, do we, we want to open up for questions, Brian? Absolutely. Um, you know, Ken, you know, one of the things I love, just looking at some of these comments, and I really just want to read through some of the comments. We do have just a few questions. But I love to see when salespeople are getting excited about what they do. And that's really what's happening here. Um, you know, Brandy says, I was encouraged to remember the value of each call, even when it was a no. So I, you know, just in, in what you were saying, putting a value on that no, I just, I, I, I love that she understands that. Oh, that is great. That is great. And then Maureen says, new challenges for myself and not to let the unfamiliar scare me. 
and Richard also says he he says uh, Richard now it, you have two fans that that were the first two to say something on here. Uh, <laughs> D- Doug Wheeler says good morning. Doug Wheeler's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. Uh, Doug Doug is one of my best friends in this business, and I won't tell you. Doug and I go back to mutual of Omaha, and I won't tell you how long ago that was. Okay. <laughs> okay. And he also wanted to add to your your uh, your your advertisements from 30 years ago. He said Marlboro tastes good like a blank should. Like a cigarette should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. And Richard said he would only get up at 6 a.m. in Vegas only for camp. <laughs> Richard, so thank great. you. <laughs> All right. So Tracy, and actually you just kind of touched on this. She asked, how can I get a copy of Ken's book? Um, and you kind of just touched on that, which you want them to do. So that's I'll get excellent. the audio. I'll get the audio version. If I'll tell you what, if you want to uh, want a hard copy and an autograph copy, um, Brian and I talked about this this morning, send me an email and we'll get you, we'll get you an autograph copy. Outstanding. Uh, now, Shauna asks, may I have a copy of your needs analysis? Yes. Send me an email and ask for the needs analysis, and I'll send the needs analysis. And I've also got a got a training webinar that goes with it. Um, I'll get that to you. Excellent. And other than your book, what other books do you recommend to read? The The one book that it's it's that I, I always recommend that's really basic is Frank Betcher's How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. Mm. Um, and it's available. I know it's available on Amazon. And, you know, that one, that that book was probably one of the most important books that I read early in my insurance career, because, like I said, it kept me in the, it kept me in the business. And, you know, his examples in there go back a hundred years ago. Um, but they are, if you look for principles in them, they are so relevant even today. And I get amazed when I when I go on Amazon and look, just look at the comments on that book, because again, here's a book that was written 70 years ago, and there are over a thousand uh, thousand comments on Amazon. You know, yeah. and most he's been dead for so many years, and most most authors would kill to have you know a thousand comments on Amazon. Absolutely, absolutely. And you said that's Frank Betcher's book, How I Rose from Failure to Success. And yeah, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. Excellent. All right. Uh, last question here says, do you have any advice on how to find time and balance servicing hundreds of Medicare clients with new sales? You know, it's 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 really interesting because one of the things you, you want to talk about and about acres of diamonds. You know, if I had lots of Medicare Advantage clients, um, two things I would I would look at right away with with the acres of diamonds there. One is talking to every single Medicare Advantage client about final expense. And two, if you know you're not putting together a hospital indemnity plan with it. I would go back and talk to every every Medicare uh, Advantage client about a hospital indemnity plan. I mean, there, if if we look if we look at our clientele, if you look at your clientele, um, that's that's one of the first places you should mine for for your acres of diamonds. Hmm. That's good. That's good. So, Ken, once again, just invaluable information that you shared with us. Thank you so much for, you know, taking this this time out of your day and uh, and going over this information. And is there anything in final that you that you want to share with with those who are on the line with us? You, you know, it's it. There's a quote from ba- Frank Batcher that that has stayed with me forever. And you know, he said. Selling is the easiest business in the world if you work it hard. It's the hardest business in the world if you work it easy. And mm. that is so true. And so we can send everyone everyone off with that with that thought. And again, I just want to I just 
I, I just want to say, you know, I would love to chat with you. Um, I'll love to send you the audio version of my book. Um, give me a call or email me. Absolutely. Once again, thank you so much. I'm going to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, hopefully you're taking something away from this call, from this webinar, uh, that's going to help you grow personally and also help you grow your business. Um, if you do need to reach out to Ken, once again, his email is ksmith at messerfinancial.com, or you can reach him uh, via phone 866-568-9649, extension 7780. Uh, if you are not contracted with Messer, um, definitely reach out to us at MFG Marketing at messerfinancial.com, or you can dial 866-568-9649 at 7819 and anyone will be happy to, to talk to you about the opportunity that we do have here. And please take a moment also to look at our events calendar at messerfinancial.com. We'll be having webinar workshops scheduled throughout the year with valuable information. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us this morning and each of you have a great day and have a great weekend also. Take care.